chat video, that countdown ended just like a split second before I expected it to. So everyone probably saw a real split freeze frame of me gulping water frantically. Which <laughs> is good. So hello everyone and welcome to Twice From Me. I'm actually going to remember to introduce myself for I think the first time in well, probably what coming up for like 20 interviews now, <laughs> so finally remembered. Um, so I'm Natalie, I'm a family historian and I run a small business called Genealogy Stories. I'm um, totally passionate nuts about history and think that you can never learn enough about the subject um, and that whatever you learn always applies to your own ancestors. So I'm delighted to be joined here today by Sylvia who stepped into the breach at the last minute after poor Laura has been struck down by a migraine. So get well soon, Laura. Um, Sylvia, thank you so much for jumping in right at the very last second. <laughs> Would you be introducing yourself? I'm sure you'll, you'll do, probably do a lot better job than I did of introducing myself. Well, I'm, I'm Sylvia. Um, I too am a keen uh, family historian. Uh, I run a, a small business, not that I'm doing very much business at the moment because I'm uh, far too busy working on my PhD thesis, which is opposition to compulsory smallpox vaccination in Scotland from 1864 to 1918. It's a long time period, actually, isn't it? It is, but then again, we don't want a huge time period. If I wanted to consider the history of um, vaccination and its predecessor inoculation, um, I'd probably go and be going back to the time of the pharaohs. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, that's, that's quite broad. That's quite broad. <laughs> Um, just a quick reminder, anyone, if you would like to comment, then please do feel free um, to jump in. I can see um, Helen's joined us. So hi, Helen. Um, Helen from Swindon in Wiltshire is here. Hi, Helen. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, so, yeah, please do feel free to comment and, and ask your questions as we're going along, especially because I am woefully unprepared and I'm in... Um, hopefully safe hands with Sylvia. So to start off with, just in case anyone doesn't know, what, what is smallpox or what was smallpox? Smallpox is a um, virus disease um, and thankfully uh, it has been eradicated throughout the world. The World Health Organization finally declared that it was the first disease to be, in fact, the only disease to be eradicated um, and they made that declaration in, 1880, in 1980. Um, and of course, a worldwide vaccination campaign was what led them to be able to say this disease is eradicated. There are two laboratories in the world that hold the smallpox virus in strict uh, conditions. One is in the United States and the other is in Russia. OK. OK, so... Um, so if you got smallpox, what was it, what was it like? Um, I, I, cause I sometimes think I've heard it compared to chickenpox and my understanding is it, that it, that it, that it's much, 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 much worse than chickenpox. Um, I, they might be in the same family, but. I think, I think, uh, it is, is very true that, uh, that the thing, the thing was that there were two different sorts of, uh, it's, it's part of what's called the variola group. And there were two variolas, the variola major and the variola minor. And the variola major uh, probably had something like an 80% mortality rate. If you got variola major, uh, you were lucky to survive. If you got variola minor, there was still 15 to 20% uh, mortality rate. But what was interesting about the variola minor, it protected you for life against variola major okay okay that's interesting and, and there are plenty of gruesome photographs <laughs> available <laughs> including if you that uh, frame of mind uh, the the welcome uh, library uh, web, website has got lots and lots of fairly gruesome images yeah, yeah, smallpox does look pretty gruesome, doesn't it? I am, um, yeah, I, I, I'm sure I read somewhere that, you know, most of our ancestors would have had smallpox scars. Um, very likely, yeah. very likely. I mean, one of our most famous uh, people who bore uh, smallpox scars 
uh, was of course uh, Elizabeth uh, Tudor, Queen Elizabeth. Okay. The yeah, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, she was. Uh, I mean, they didn't expect her to survive. Um, and really, apart from sweating it out and wrapping her in, in red flannel, uh, because for some reason red flannel had magical properties, um, you know, I mean, they were she was preparing to die. She lost her eyelashes. Uh, that could cause uh, it could cause that that sort of thing. And of course, she's well known for wearing wigs, um, and that is probably one of the reasons why she wore the wigs to the extent that she did. That uh, she suffered tremendous hair loss as a result of the infection from uh, smallpox. And another mm -hmm. famous uh, victim was, of course, uh, Lady Mary Workley Montague, uh, who uh, her brother died from smallpox. She was also attacked by smallpox. She survived. And she also lost all her eyelashes and eyebrows and so forth in the early 18th century. It must have been so traumatic to see your children so ill like that and know that there's nothing you can do. Um, and and also, even when you've been ill and you're recovering from something like that, to, to lose your hair and your eyelashes and your eyebrows can be so upsetting. So I have, they have my empathy. <laughs> um, so when was kind of smallpox at its most prevalent in, in this country, in England or England or Wales? Uh, well, nobody's entirely sure. But we're probably talking something like the 15th century that there start to be these unexplained, undiagnosed diseases. But people who write down, uh, if you like, the what they see, um, scholars of that period tend to the view that these were some of the early cases of smallpox. I mean, every mammal has a pox variety. Um, so you've got horse pox, monkey pox, cow pox, you know, so, um, and of course, the, the other interesting thing about small pox is, you should ask me, what was great pox? Well, great, uh. pox. <laughs> great pox was a venereal disease. <laughs> That's a whole other talk. <laughs> a whole other talk. <laughs> Something also pretty prevalent in our ancestors, I think. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, <laughs> So, so yes, I mean, it, it was around and it, even into the 20th century, it, the ten, uh, you could expect there to be an epidemic roughly every seven to ten years, something of that cycle. And for some reason, an infection would crop up and it would then just spread like wildfire. Okay. Um, and the, in in England particularly if you like to think of the British Isles, let's call it British Isles, but it was particularly England, um, we have the first inoculation against the smallpox, which is on one of Lady Mary Wortley Montague's children in 1721. So it's actually, this year, it's 300 years since the first inoculation against smallpox. Okay, now before we um, before we had the interview, we had a quick phone call, emergency phone call to... to... <laughs> to square off a few questions and I asked you you know is there anything that you wish people asked or is there anything that's really important that I must ask and you said to me you must ask me what the difference between inoculation and vaccination is and I have to admit I don't know so I'm quite looking forward to the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well inoculation meant that uh, the patient was infected with uh, this gets correct well um, the think of a blister like a chicken box, like a blister, and it's got fluid in the, in the blister. And they would take some of the fluid from the blister, just a little drop, and they would make a little cut uh, at the wrists, uh, for example, of, of the patient, and they would insert some of this liquid to infect the patient. Now, this evolved in sort of Turkey and Greece, where Lady Mary first came to be aware of this technique, and what the it was something that was practiced by the old wise women, uh, you know, the, the type of scenario it wasn't wasn't medicals. It was medical men. It was, uh, you know, the old ladies type of thing. And um, they would then cover the site where they would dropped the, the, the virus and put half a walnut shell on top of it and bind it up and leave it for a week. And then when you went back at the end of the week, there was a nice blister there 
and the patient was starting to come out in spots, um, you knew that you had successfully infected the person. Now, the trick was to infect the child, because it was predominantly children, infect the child with a variola minor. And for some reason, they had to, they seemed to have a knack for working out which people have the major and which had the minor, but there was no guarantee. So you are giving somebody a dose of a potentially fatal disease. So there was risk involved with this procedure. Now, what then happens is that uh, inoculation starts to happen in the uh, in England, in London, in, in 1820, 18, 1721. And it does start to spread, uh, you know, through through the country. Um, and you have doctors who are learning how to do this and perform this technique. But they developed this wonderful technique that required you having to be purged and bled and put on. Uh, starved vir virtually before you would be um, infected with the disease. So you were in a fairly weakened state before they started popping any, any uh, virus into you. And one of the people who endured this principle as a, as a young boy was a Gloucestershire lad called Edward Jenner. And he had, by all accounts, a fairly horrendous experience um, uh, uh, as a result of being inoculated against um, smallpox. So move on, by the time he has done all his, his studying and he's done his apprenticeship with John Hunter in London and he comes back to Gloucester and by, he was very much interested in botany and uh, ornithology and, and things of this sort. But he'd always heard this rumour about the, the milkmaids never having smallpox and John Hunter encouraged him to perform experiments. And whilst Jenna was, well, he wouldn't get away with it these days because he wouldn't get through any, he wouldn't get through any ethical uh, sort of uh, procedure, you know, that uh, because he eventually he inoculated his gardener's uh, young boy. Um, and, you know, if your employer wants to inoculate your child, are you going to say no, you know, in the uh, in the late 18th century? Uh, but let's set aside the ethics of the scenario. But anyway, he inoculated Fitz and Fitz as well. There are stories that there were other farmers in uh, in in the country. And a particular one is known as Benjamin Jesty, who lived in Dorset, who inoculated his his uh, his wife and his children with with cowpox matter. Uh, so the uh, the argument for who was the first inventor um is um hotly contested in certain quarters more <laughs> than later um that you know who was the originator well you know the, the laurels go to edward jenner um and of course the latin for cow is vaca v a w c a and eventually what what jenner was doing jenner was performing cowpox inoculation. He was infecting James Phipps with cowpox. Okay. Um, but because of the vaca from the cow, it became vaccination. That's okay. how we get the word vaccination. But if you want to be a pedant, it was cowpox <laughs> inoculation. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. So, um yeah, so it was the, the cowpox that was protecting them from the um, smallpox, and that's why the, the milkmaids weren't getting it. That makes sense. Okay. Um, Helen's just, um, Helen Shields here has just popped up a note to say that, that Jenna's house is a, is a very interesting and small it, museum. I don't know where that is, actually. It's actually in a place called Barclay in Gloucestershire, um, and it is wonderful. The, uh, the manager of the museum is a chap called Owen Gower, and had we been planned on this, I would have let him know. Uh, but when I visited uh, there in uh, September 2019, I said to him, you haven't got anything about Charles Maitland. Charles Maitland is the surgeon who performed that first inoculation in London in April 1721. And uh, then I did a talk for them earlier this year with them earlier this year. <laughs> he sent me a message last week saying, when you come next time, you'll notice that we have changed <laughs> Are displayed to include a, a Scottish surgeon, <laughs> so so uh, that's quite quite nice to know. But yes, the, 
the Jenner house, I mean, it is such a beautiful house and in wonderful settings. It, it's sort of, you know, Georgian rectory type building by the church yeah. and it, it's fabulous. I'll make sure there's a link in the um, blog post that, that goes along with these um, the interview so that everyone can go and find it. Um, I, I kind of want to hear more about the Dorset chap one day as well because I'm uh, based in, well, right on the border of Dorset. Sorry? Sadly, I don't know quite enough about him, but uh, his name pops up in all the literature. <laughs> okay, I, I will go and have to have a hunt for him. <laughs> just uh, just being like living on the border of Dawson myself um so so when they very first started inoculation um obviously so when when after Jenna had um you know tried his his cowpox inoculations how like how did it get from Jenna doing it to to kind of you know compulsory um mass vaccination or inoculation what what well, you've got, got to remember that um, a lot of uh, a lot of the doctors who were performing these uh, uh, operations, let's call them operations, uh, were charging to do it, you know, and all along the sort of private practice had been, uh, you know, making money out of providing this protection because people were desperate not to not to catch this disease, uh, not because of the fatalities and the disfigurement. And so you know, lots of um, sort of uh, landed gentry wanted all their servants inoculating or vaccinating, for example. Um, and so, you know, you had to pay for it. But the trouble was that although at the turn of the 18th into the 19th century, the government was very much taking a, a hands off approach to what is, after all, a public health measure, um, they started to be concerned at the number of children whose families lived in poverty who were dying as a result of contracted smallpox and uh, after a it took about best part of 30 years of debate before finally in england and wales and i can't emphasize that strongly enough <laughs> england and wales um legislation was passed in the 1840 vaccination act and it offered free vaccination to anybody that wanted it. And the problem that happened was at that time, you may be aware that there were only a limited number of, shall we call them local authority organizations, the Royal Boroughs, that, that scenario. Mm -hmm. But in 18, by 1837, we had the workhouse system, the boards of guardians that were a, an administrative system that operated pretty much uniformly across England and Wales. And so the responsibility was placed within the remit of the boards of guardians to operate the vaccination system in their area. And a lot of people objected because they considered that it was, it identified them as paupers. And no matter how often the government said, no, you are not a pauper, uh, it is not, well, I used to work in, <laughs> we're very familiar with the benefits system and there's a, an expression of recourse to public funds. Uh, having that vaccination yeah. was not a recourse to public funds. It was nothing, it was not associated with pauperism. Uh, so people were a bit wary about, you know, particularly those people who were not paupers. They didn't, you know, they were respectable people. They didn't want to be associated with pauperism and so forth. Um, and so it was... There were several things the Act continued to need tweaking. They were always doing bits of tweaking. And one of the things was that in 1840, whilst it was recommended, it was not compulsory. Uh, there was an Act in 1853 that did make it compulsory. And it was at that point that people started to get hot under the collar about it um for, for all sorts of uh, all sorts of reasons so this was a, a free service for people yeah people were saying i don't want it yeah um, but was that was remind it, you of anything mm, yeah a little bit was it was it one of the was it one of the first um or was it the first free free inoculation like that kind of mass inoculation is actually the first okay. public measure uh okay. and yes, and yes, it was free. 
um, and uh, as I say, it causes the <laughs> Oh, it started and it just rumbled on and on. And to what degree was that objection um, to do with, with fear of, of the inoculation going wrong and, and, and ending up um, with the disease? I think uh, a lot of it was more to do with what today we'd call civil liberties. Okay. I, I am not going to be told by the government what I should do. Uh, it is my right as a parent to decide what happens to my child. But there were issues with um, children who had been vaccinated and who um, suffered as a result of, the, of being vaccinated. But it was not necessarily because the vaccine was of dubious quality. It was probably because the uh, the the person performing the vaccination was not exactly hygienic you know I mean we know it was whenever Joseph Lister invented antiseptics and, and things of this sort you know, so they, they would have a scalpel with which they were scraping the arm of the child and it was like wipe it on your on your arm and uh, you know on your jacket before you do the next one yeah um, I was going to say what date what date was it did you say that the the it became compulsory 1853 yeah. So yeah, yeah. So we're looking Crimean Wars, eighteen fifties, isn't it? With Nightingale and the washing, you know, the, yeah. the start of beginning to think about continually washing your hands. So <laughs> sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so I mean, so probably one of the things was as well that they they used what's called arm to arm vaccination. Um, so they used cowpox, what was called cowpox lymph to uh in vaccinate child number one so at, you know the following week mum or father or responsible parent had to take the baby back to the vaccination officer who wanted to see if there were any blisters on the arm and if there were blisters on the arm then he the vaccinator and it was always a he certainly in these early days would take some of that fluid from baby number one and insert it into the arm of baby number two so if baby number one had some sort of uh, congenital disease and syphilis is very often mentioned in, in this case um you were effectively infecting infecting baby number two with blood matter because of course when they took that and they made a cut in baby number two you're putting you, you're mingling the blood from baby number one into baby number two it wasn't done under the most hygienic of, uh, of circumstances and so as a result um you're getting this uh you know infection being transmitted now nowadays we understand about pre-existing medical conditions um and you know i'm don't like using the expression herd, herd immunity at the moment, but if we think about herd immunity, um, we know that you have to have a high vaccination level of people who can be vaccinated to protect those people who cannot be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And undoubtedly, some of those children who were vaccinated and who suffered some sort of lasting effect, if not um you know, dying as a result of the operation, um, then you can understand why these cases start to arise. And I have to say, as a parent myself, I can understand that if somebody had lost a child to what they said was vaccination was the cause of it, then you would perhaps be understandably reluctant to risk losing a second child uh, to that same procedure. There's no proof that vaccination caused death, uh, just as, you know, there's no uh, sensible argument that says uh, MMR causes autism, for, for example. You know, <laughs> the arguments remain the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. No, I, I think it is sensible. I think, um, so do you know to what extent or how, how well the government tried to um, inform or educate people about the procedure that they were doing as well because obviously that's quite important the more you know, the more you understand um how something works um the, the more likely you are to kind of come to accept it or to to um 
yeah to to yeah. feel comfortable with it I guess whereas if you're kind of blindly being told to give your baby's arm to some surgeon <laughs> um and you don't know how it works you know or doctor sorry yeah and you don't know how it works um that must be quite fright you know must have been quite yeah, frightening I mean, I mean the, the the trouble is that um the they were using the big stick you have your child vaccinated or else you will be taken to court you will be fined if you don't pay the fine we will send the bailiffs in if you have no goods to seize we will send you to prison okay and this was the thing was that uh, a child you could be fined imprisoned whatever for the child and if you failed to have that child vaccinated you could continue to be fined or imprisoned and there are cases where uh, fathers were sent to jail three four times for failing to vaccinate the same child and i think we can understand why people got very uh, agitated about it and you start to see from the mid uh, 1850s onwards the evolution of the anti-vaccination uh, societies at local little local societies ar around the country um, and they start producing literature and this is their propaganda and they produce these leaf leaflets um, which were distributed for a, a halfpenny or a penny or something of this sort it was the social media of the time telling people all these horrible things that could happen because of vaccination and also the horrible stories about the impurity of the of the vaccine that was used and uh, you know so you can see that propaganda and the government did not did not really do much to counter that propaganda at all okay yeah they just kept kind of waving the same stick <laughs> rather yeah. than dangling any carrots okay yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, in in what kind of ways did um, the, the, those that were anti-vaxxers? In what kind of ways did they start to protest? Oh, they would uh, they, they would uh, stand up in, in court, in the matter of principle, and uh, you know they weren't going to have their child vaccinated. Now you have to remember here that the law is different in Scotland than it is to England and Wales, um, and it's important in in relation to the penalties because in England and Wales if you didn't pay a fine they could send the bailiffs in and if you haven't got any goods to seize uh, they can imprison you in Scotland they haven't got the bailiffs option it's pay the fine or straight off to jail okay um, uh, but yes I mean the thing was that the more people went to prison the more people got incensed about it now yeah. the thing is that responsibility of the parent for vaccination it was normally the father however if it was a, a widow um or a, a single parent um then she was the person who was responsible to ensure that the child was vaccinated so you start finding women who can't afford to pay the fines who have nothing basically and you start sending women to prison you can see how this is doing so much yeah so much bad publicity, if you like, for for the government. And I of course, all they're doing is tightening the law. All the, the you know, they uh, yeah. And yeah, there's a, there is this um, erroneous uh, statement. Audrey Collins will like me for uh, confirm this. That registration of the birth of your child was compulsory from 1837. But in eight, nine, 1874, when a lot of people say that's when it became compulsory 1874 and the vaccination act and everything else it's like that really does you've got the six weeks to register the child and all these procedures so that's where you get the 1874 act from but i mean that really was the the when if you like uh, things started to get very very dodgy now where i live in in west yorkshire um the board of guardians here is uh, uh, notorious for having actually had uh, seven of the uh, six, six of the guardians being sent to prison for failing to enforce the law because the responsibility for enforcing the law was with the board of guardians and the board of guardians. It is around the time that um, 
the uh, franchise is extended to more working men um, and the secret ballot is coming in rather than having your vote recorded in the yeah. poll box. Um, and so the, van the, the Anti-Vaccination League here started to identify suitable men of standing within the town to stand for election to the Board of Guardians and their manifesto, if you like, was we will not enforce the law. And so they get over a few years, they managed to pack the Board of Guardians with anti-vaccinators. And as a result of that, uh, you end up with, no, they're not vaccinating. So the, the local government board take them to court and get a writ of mandamus to say, you must enforce the law. And they spend the next two years basically doing everything they could to avoid it. And in the end, the government said, that the local government board said, no, that's enough. We're making an example. And they were actually jailed for contempt of court. Wow. So um, if you're, so say you're a single woman and you've, um, you've been arrested and put in jail for, for not having your child vaccinated, presumably then if there's nobody else to take the child in, the child goes into the workhouse anyway. Yep. And then presumably there, as long as you haven't got any anti-vax, um, uh, anti-vaxxers on the board, then, then your child would then be inoculated whilst in the workhouse. One of the responsibilities of the medical officer was to ensure that all children in the workhouse were vaccinated. Okay. okay. So yeah. the, the child uh, was vaccinated. Part of the trouble with the Board of Guardians was that they were, they received this list every six months of which parent had not had their child vaccinated. And they were supposed to instruct the uh, vaccination officer to prosecute these parents the vaccination officer could not do it off his own bat they had to there had to be a formal instruction and they would not give the instruction they left it lying on the table meeting after meeting after meeting so, uh, so how big a problem was this like how like do we have any sort of idea of what kind of numbers were um not getting their children vaccinated i don't have any um statistics for England. I haven't studied the actual statistics for the whole country in, in any depth. Um, but I certainly know that in Scotland, it was a completely different kettle of fish. Most people were very happy to have their children vaccinated and very compliant. But again, it was a completely different uh, system that was operating in Scotland and all tied up with Scots poor law, which differs from English poor law. Okay. Okay, that's really interesting. I hadn't realised there was that link between being associated with um, poverty as well in the beginning. Um, uh, Jane here, who's watching, has from all the way from the other side of the world, has just said that um, given the high rate of child mortality, I think that makes it um, even more understandable, really, that people had been so sceptical if there were examples of children who had died. Absolutely. Um, and I suppose as well, it would e even if one child's um if even if one child hadn't infected or tainted the vaccination of another child you you could quite easily have a situation where you're being um vaccinated about against something and you're already suffering from something else like you know yeah. a week later you come down with scarlet fever and then people start saying oh well, it's the it's the it's the vaccination that caused the scarlet <laughs> fever I'm, I'm guessing absolutely um and uh, you know it's the it's that old sort of cause and effect argument, isn't it? You know, that because I was vaccinated and then the following week I had a rash. Well, yeah, that's why I've got the rash sort of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. And My nan and granddad are in their 80s and they refuse to have the flu vaccine every single year because one of their relatives had the flu after having the flu vaccine. Yeah. Um the fact that that if you're yeah. listening nan and granda please go get the flu vaccine <laughs> but they won't <laughs> um but, but yeah it's that I, similar I, I can understand entire i understand entirely yeah. what, i mean i've read um the guardian minute books here and you've got um stories of parents who have got a child who they uh has died or a child who is severely imaged uh you know damaged as because they believe it's through vaccination and you read those accounts and some of them are positively gruesome mm. um you know like limbs arms turning black from shoulder to fingertips you know and, and, and things of this sort what else are you going to blame you're going to blame the vaccination aren't you 
Yeah, of course you are. Of course, especially when you don't understand how it works. I mean, you don't understand how the body works either, so, or, or what germs are, or, yeah, of course you are. It's completely that's, understandable. That's another one, because, of course, the, you have this big um, argument between the sanitarians um, and those who believe in germ theory. Germ theory is evolving in the late 1860s into the 1870s. Um, you're probably familiar with the story in London of the great stink and basil jet and the sewers and what have you. And of course, it was this miasma from the refuse and the state and everything else and the sewage and what have you. Yeah. That was the cause of disease. Yeah, which uh, makes a lot of sense, you know, but quite often yeah. do associate disease with um, bad smells. So so you've, you've got this. And so let's have clean water. Let's have good sanitation. Let's have decent housing. Therefore, you will eradicate disease. So you don't need vaccination once you've given these measures have been implemented and given time to work. Um, so I don't know quite what they make with how I keep washing your hands at the moment, but uh, you know. <laughs> so, but but so you've you've got these people who are supporters of the sanitarian movement, who are uh, anti-vax because they think you just give these measures time to take effect and then everything will be absolutely fine because there will be no more disease because we've got rid of miasma. Okay, so at what at what point do you? It kind of sounds like the the government and the anti vaxxers at this point in history are kind of almost, um, you know, really locked into a battle. At what point does that start to ease and people start to, um, or the majority of people start to accept that that actually yes, it is safe to get my child vaccinated and and, and I'll I'll do it. Well, it didn't. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, that's interesting. Uh, uh, what happened was that um, if I use the expression conscientious objection, mm -hmm. most people will think military First World War. Yep. What we had with, uh, in actual fact, was that the con parents wanted the right to conscientiously object to the vaccination of their children either because of religious belief, political belief, they really thought their child could be seriously damaged as a result of being vaccinated. And so we get to the 1880, 1889, and eventually there's been a lot of lobbying in Parliament and things of this sort. So they have a Royal Commission into vaccination. And this Royal Commission makes six reports and it takes it till... <laughs> 1896 before it issues its final report this report amongst its various recommendations is that uh, they should get rid of arm-to-arm -arm vaccination and only use uh, calf lymph for each child on vaccination which sets up its own problems because they haven't got enough vaccine supplies of calf lymph um so that's another gruesome story for another day um and uh, but but one of the things and it, it recommends that you cannot be prosecuted more than once for uh, an offense uh, for failing to have one child vaccinated um and of course uh, one of the big things it comes in is that there ought to be a conscience clause uh, there ought to be legislation that permits a parent to uh, conscientiously object. So what happens is that uh, you have the general election, uh, you have a parliament comes in and eventually they introduce some legislation which comes into effect in 1898 in England and Wales, uh, which allows you to go before a magistrate and say you've got a conscience on this matter and the magistrate's supposed to give you a piece of paper which you give to the registrar and that means that you will not be fined for failing to have your child vaccinated because they thought a lot of people just thought vaccination was an inconvenience because the child was ill as a result of being vaccinated obviously um you know they decided they would make it as difficult as possible for a parent to claim uh, the conscientious objections. So the first thing, it had to be dad. Uh, mothers, uh, married women, were not able to do that. Uh, it had to be the father. Again, you've got the issue of the fathers who are absent for long periods of time. I think if they were a guest of Her Majesty, they could probably, uh, a woman might be able to do it, or quite often they had to actually send a letter and get the father to say that this is what he wanted. 
Um, and so I probably you yeah. couldn't read or write potentially. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty much yes. Um, but you, so you get all these things that you know it's difficult. And some magistrates were asking questions like, "How do I know you've got a conscience?" Uh, you know, I'm I'm not signing on the dotted line and sort of thing. So there was a lot of dissatisfaction, and so eventually, and of course, there was a tremendous dissatisfaction in Scotland because although the anti-vaccination movement in Scotland was nothing like as numerous uh, as the, in was happening in England and Wales, um, they they were understandably affronted because they were being discriminated against. And there's a great example of the Duke of Hamilton, the Premier Duke of Scotland, who, like all these people, had um, properties in England. And his first uh, two children were born in England, uh, down in Dorset. And uh, so the uh, the Duke goes to uh, to Wareham, I think, I think it was Wareham Magistrates Court, and says to the magistrate, uh, I conscientiously object to my child being vaccinated and is given a certificate without much cross-examination by all accounts. But anyway, he gets his bit of paper. Had that child been born in Scotland, he wouldn't have been able to claim conscientious objection. The child would have had to be vaccinated. Now, the Duke's, the Duchess was actually a vegetarian, anti-vivisectionist, and these are in parallel with so many of the anti-vaccination people. Um, and so you get this campaign because workers on the Duke's estate in Hamilton in Scotland were being prosecuted, were being sent to jail. So the Duke was actually quite sympathetic to the anti-vaccination cause. Um, and he only had, his wife only gave birth in Scotland once the Lord changed in Scotland, which I think that's quite interesting fact. She had yeah. six children, I believe, three, three in England and three in Scotland. So that's quite some feat that's quite some determination to yeah in, a, in, in an age without the contraceptives that we have <laughs> what, what we end what we end up with is by the time we get to 1907 as there'd been general election in 1906 the liberals have a landslide victory and one of their things they do is equalize the law between england and scotland uh, so that you can make a statutory declaration that you seriously believe that vaccination will harm your child and again the legislation is framed all the time so that it's got to be father and i've got some cracking examples of uh from uh, 1914 1915 when fathers are in the army uh if they're still in this country on basic training um the form that has to be filled in has to be filled in by the father so it's got to be you know Mother's got to post it to her husband wherever he is at the army camp. He's got to fill it in. He's got to send it back so she can take it back to the registrar. All within a fairly tight time scale that they've got to, to turn, turn this round. And another case where um, a, a lady gave birth and shortly afterwards, sadly, she died, leaving her husband a widower with four children. And so it, as it happened, his brother and sister-in-law were unable to have a family of their own. So he effectively gave the baby to them to raise as their own. Mm -hmm. So the baby's uncle went and filled in the form and that wouldn't satisfy the local registrar. It had to be the biological father who now moved from one part of Scotland to another and he had to fill in the form and they didn't get it back to the registrar in time. So they were, he was liable I don't know that he was, but he was technically liable for prosecution for having failed to meet the six month deadline that they had in Scotland. Blimey, blimey. Um, I've just got a few comments that I just wanted to bring up on screen before I lose them. It's fascinating. Thank you. Um, so um, Penny says, I've been researching BFG. I'm sorry, I, I apologise for my ignorance, but I'm not sure what that stands for. And um, immigration to Canada from the UK included his correspondence approving medical checks for all family members. It would be interesting to see if vaccinations were highlighted. That um, that kind of made me think of the um, the First World War. Um, uh, some of the enlistment papers, they you know they ask whether you've been vaccinated. Um, and um, can I can I, I have seen a few no's actually. <laughs> Can I suggest that you yeah. actually have a look at 
uh, you can find them obviously, an attestation paper for a regular and an attestation paper for a volunteer. Okay. Because the regular army had to be vaccinated. Yeah. But if you were a volunteer and you had a conscientious objection, they could not enforce vaccination upon you. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I yeah. found that in Hansard of all places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can find one, that would be interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, we get um, uh, the uh, Men of Worth project sometimes on, on Twitter mm -hmm. and what have you, and it's, it's actually a friend of mine. So I said, I said to him, uh, do, do you know about this? And he went, no, I'm going away to have a look now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Jane says, I wonder if compulsory vaccination contributed to people's decisions to emigrate. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, it did. Um, the, the, well, I was talking earlier about the border guardians who were uh, sent to prison. And when they were released, a number of them did actually emigrate. Um, okay. and I certainly know one who ended up in Australia. Uh, that and died in one of the goldfield rushes uh, down there um, and somebody went to canada and then ended up in california and suddenly they wouldn't allow them into wouldn't allow them into the united States, well, into america until he'd been vaccinated so they wouldn't let them off the ship without being vaccinated oh right i funny <laughs> if, um, penny has just come back to say when she said i've been researching bfg bfg and this makes total sense now she's been researching the border guardian and immigration to canada from the uk um, so that's very interesting. I'd be be really interesting to see your um, work on that, Penny. Um, I think the things you, I could say is that obviously, when you have vaccination, it leaves the scar. Yeah. And if you think back to education and pupil teachers, um, and so there were certain occupations you could not have unless you could show your show your vaccination certificate or show your scars. And pupil teachers was one of them. Okay. Couldn't be couldn't be a pupil teacher unless you were vaccinated. That, uh, and Helen's just said that her grandfather emigrated to Canada and had to prove he had been vaccinated against smallpox. Yes. So um, it's, it's interesting to see how um, our history of the inoculation um, marries into the history of other, other countries. So I have to ask, um, Sylvia, um, if anyone wants to go and try and find out um, if, if they wanted to try and do some digging and see if they could find out whether any of their ancestors had or hadn't been vaccinated or had objected, where where would you advise them to to start? I appreciate it might be a bit of a punt in some ways. Um, but I would actually start with, um, and I would use for search, even if you don't use it for viewing the article, I would look at the British Newspaper Archive because you can refine the search so much. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, if I tell you that for my PhD research, I've identified something like four and a half thousand newspaper articles, uh, and I haven't used them or read them all, <laughs> but it's there if you look for it. And it's that classic, you know, put Mr. Um, Jenkinson, don't put Herbert Jenkinson, you put Mr. Jenkinson. Mm -hmm. Use phrases like anti vaccination and, and go in there and, and phrase it, but there are hundreds and hundreds uh prosecution vaccination prosecutions a good combination to use um and uh shall i tell my story now that i was yes you? yes yes because i haven't asked you about your story and that's a good example of some nifty bit of research <laughs> right well i was in london at the welcome library uh, uh for my phd research and i was looking at this wonderful journal which they have copies in the welcome library called the vaccination inquirer and health review. It's a riveting title and a riveting read. <laughs> um, and as you go through it, it's, I mean, it, it is the journal of the anti-vaccination uh, societies. And so it, it reports on politics, uh, lobbying, prosecutions, boards of guardians, material, all sorts of things. And I taken with permission of the archive, obviously taking lots of photographs and I come back home and I had all these images to, to print off. And around about the same time, and it was before Roots Tech London. Can you all remember Roots Tech London? Oh, so long ago. <laughs> but it was before Roots Tech London. And we were, uh, the, the, lady, uh, uh, the lady in Australia said there was a family rumour that her great-grandfather had been sent to prison for uh, failing to have his children vaccinated. Could that happen? And I said, 
yes, you know, you know, tell me a little bit about it. And so we we exchanged a few messages and so forth. And I couldn't find anything uh, particularly about him. And I said, well, just because I can't find anything doesn't mean it isn't there. You know, it's just that we can't find it for whatever reason. And then I was sitting well, on Saturday afternoon <laughs> going through my printouts and slapping post-it notes and messages all over them and things of this sort. And suddenly her great grandfather's name leapt out at me on the page from this particular uh, exciting journal that they've got in the Welcome Library. And she was actually online on Facebook at the time. So I said, give me your email address. I think I found him. And so I emailed it to her. We couldn't find a newspaper account. Um, so, of course, she's in Australia. I'm in England. So when I wake up on the Sunday morning, there's a message from her. She's found a letter in one of the Glasgow newspapers from her great grandfather explaining why he did not wish to have his children vaccinated. Um, that was just an absolute amazing fluke of good luck um, that we were able to prove that the family story was right in parts. It wasn't completely correct because the story was that twins had been vaccinated and died. They weren't twins. They were children who were born about three years apart. I think it is something, something of that sort. And sadly, they died a few months after they'd been vaccinated. There's no way you can say that it was vaccination was the direct reason that they died. Um, but sadly, these two children died. And I think the exciting thing was that the child who he refused to have vaccinated was the lady in Australia's grandmother. It's so, just amazing. amazing story. That's amazing. That's genealogy gold there. <laughs> She's written Those... about it. I'll have to. I'll have to find it and send send it to you, Natalie. Yes, do, and I'll, I'll I'll put it on the blog post. That would be great. Um, whilst we're taking a sip, um, I was just going to throw the uh, questions open to to anyone who's still watching and, and wants to comment with any questions. Um, just before we we start wrapping up, really. So I'll give you a couple of minutes whilst I um just check for any comments. Actually, okay. Um. I was going to ask something then, and it's just completely gone out of my head. Yes, that's what I was going to ask. What led you to start researching this particular niche? What is it about it that you that you enjoy so much? Well, when I was doing my master's degree, uh, you know, I had to write a dissertation, and it's it can't be about you know my family history. It's got to be something that uh, you know. So basically, a lot of them tend to have more of a sort of social history aspect to it that include families um, and I'd gone to the National Archives to look at records of in the correspondence series uh, MH12 in, in the National Archives in Kew and usually uh, one of their big books which is about you know a nice big fat book uh, will cover about 18 months and then I suddenly noticed that the it was like every six months every eight months you know there was a new folder and it was like what on earth's going on here? So I looked at these and and the story of the vaccinated and the board of guardians all started to to come out of that. So I thought that was a good material for my master's dissertation uh, to to write about what happened. And of course, when you're doing a dissertation, a piece of research like that, you've got to review the literature and see what happens. Now, what I found was that um, things were such as well nothing really happened in Scotland I thought why so I'm answering my question of why <laughs> I research and the first thing was that uh, I eventually came across it's about 150 documents including headed note paper um, for the Scottish Anti-Vaccination League so there was something in Scotland, uh, but because there is so little primary archival material to, to look at, we've just got these small collection that's in the University of Edinburgh Library uh, archives. It's a case of what other resources have I been able to use to bring together the story? Now, if anybody wants to see any of the propaganda that the Anti-Vaccination Leagues come out, I think if you use 
Internet Archive or Google Books or something of this sort and and um, search for vaccination tracts and you'll come across some absolute belters. Um, and one of my favourites uh, is comes from the uh, Mothers of London Mothers Against and, uh, Small Pot Compulsory Vaccination. And it's a story from a dentist and he's been in the uh, West Indies and um, he says that um, you know, none of the native children, and pardon my terminology because I'm thinking of the wording that he uses, but mm -hmm. basically he's saying none of the native children have dental caries. It's only the Europeans that have dental caries. And of course, it's only the Europeans that have been vaccinated. Ergo, vaccination causes dental decay. I think okay. it might have been sponsored by the British Sugar Corporation. I'm not sure. <laughs> But, you, I mean, some of those you can laugh at. Some of them are a lot more, you know. I yeah, mean, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Grim ones. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, the, yeah, the past should come with a warning label, really, shouldn't they? <laughs> Not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> okay. And, um, uh, Sylvia, where, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for stepping into the breach. And it's been, I've really, really enjoyed tonight. So thank you very much. Um, well, where can people find you um, if they want to... Um, if they want to follow you and, and, and see what happens with your work as it develops. Well, I'm, obviously I'm on Twitter and <laughs> my handle on Twitter is at HistoryLady2013. That's because I started on Twitter in 2013. Isn't that amazing? Um, I also, my research business is uh, called Recover Your Roots. Uh, so you can Google that and it's got my contact details in there as well. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Um, it's been an absolute uh, treat. And thank you, everybody, for, for, for commenting. And there's lots of thank yous coming up here now. So Jane saying, fascinating, thank you. And Helen as well. It's a delight. And I can see lots of other people watching. So I'm sure they're, they're nodding away their thanks. But yeah, thank you, everybody, for this evening. It's been um, really wonderful. Um, and uh, thank you very much, Sylvia, for, again for joining me. Very welcome. And, uh, I will be back in a fortnight for another episode of Twice Removed. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>